Hey, thanks for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where two visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that come up in and around making things to communicate visually. Uh, we think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger, a user experience and game designer. How goes See you again, it, Jersey? Rob? Hey. Uh, doing okay. Uh, so, yeah. you know what? It's been mm -hmm. a crazy June, a lot of stuff happening. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened in the past month that we haven't really talked about on the show is you went to the IO Festival again. I did. I know. I somehow lucked out and was able to go for like the fifth time that I've yeah been able to attend the event. And I, it's, yeah, it's something I super look forward to and, and you know, enjoyed quite a bit once again. And we've we've talked about this a few times in the past because uh, I mean there's always so much that I that uh, by going to this conference called IO, which is um, a bit of um, uh, an exploration and celebration of of using let's see um, design, art, technology, uh, data, data visualization, uh, interactivity, and like all sorts of interesting expressions of, of um, interactive experiences and stuff, and people who make them, and then what do they think about when they make them, and turn and they turn it into talks where they can share about their work and the impact, and um, like you know what what led up to it, and a bit about them and their backgrounds, because there's so many such a wide variety of people that that talk at such an event and teach and stuff, um, and it's the kind of event where. A lot of times when you see someone giving a talk, they are also attending talks and whatnot. Uh, that it's, um, it's a, it's, it's a really, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a community that cares a lot about what they're doing. Right. And so they, and so they're, they do enter territory of, um, well, reaching out to folks who either sponsor or or design or participate in creating systems like that that collect data or that um that you know when you when you're doing this it's like that could get used in different ways think about that think systemically think inclusively right here's examples and how stuff can go well or go wrong and um so it's meant to really you know hook you as a pr practitioner in this kind of thing and um you know, you know, get you excited and bought into, you know, not just the technology and celebrating like, Hey, technology's neat. Never question it. Um, don't worry. It's instead of that kind of conference, which that could be cool, right? You, you learn new things and carry that home with you and whatnot. But like, it's sort of, um, well, yeah, this is neat, but be thoughtful about it kind of. And, and here's why. And, um, it's quite a yeah it's quite a quite a great uh, it happens to be local to me too so it's that that helps as far as me being able to attend it as regularly as i have been um but yeah it's it's i get excited about it so i appreciate we have this venue to talk about it jersey <laughs> and I was, um, I was just pulling up uh the, one of the first times we talked about it was over 100 episodes ago, mm. uh, episode 130, reflecting on IO 2015. I guess mm. uh, Ann and I came out to Minneapolis, and you and Ann went to that. That's right. Uh, that was in 2015. Holy oak, Massachusetts. Um, all right. So, well, do you want to just dive into it then? Uh, definitely. And also, so in, in not just as a, like, this episode isn't just like, um, you know, a review of IO and whatnot. And by the way, I mean, I have, I have nothing to do with the event other than I'm a big fan, right? I, I don't, um, yeah, I've, I have nothing to do with the event, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, um, just, you know, heads up if you're curious, that kind of thing. I don't want to misrepresent, right? And, uh -huh. um, uh, that I want to get out of the way and also mention that, you know, there's this whole, uh, I mean, as we've, you know, taken a look at in the past, um, there's the whole note taking thing that I do, I thought might be interesting to explore this time, maybe dig into that, into that a little bit, uh, more as we look at, um, you know, a couple of things like, you know, taking a tour of those notes, um, in the second half, but then in, in the first half, actually, I took an interesting workshop called observe, collect, draw that um, that that sparked a little interest when I shared some of this on Instagram, and uh, it'd be fun to 
to dive into that one a little bit more as our first as our first part all right so as the first part goes let's go into the first part with the bridge music (laughs) to mimic or to mirror how excited rob gets when we get talking about these subjects um all right so you attended this workshop (laughs) i and so i did (laughs) dragon ball (laughs) is fun the end um so (laughs) it's that that dang song i (laughs) seriously i know it's coming still happens still hooks me every time so interactive-storyteller.com is where you can find this post and we we will link to this in the show notes but this is attended the observe collect draw workshop Mm -hmm. posted on june 27th 2018 (laughs) <laughs> yep. Yeah. In part because I knew we were going to uh, go through this and I thought there's just, <laughs> there's a lot here. Why not? Why not make a blog post out of it? So um, the, uh, the instructors for this workshop are actually um, former, uh, well, f- former and current uh, IO presenters. And uh, I, they, they're, there are a couple of, of, of uh, like data related designers and visualizers that, I mean, they, they met, and thought um, it'd be neat to work on a project together. And uh, one of the talks, I think they gave this Dear Data talk in 2015, which, That's right. was, which was a share out of this project they did for like a year of um, writing postcards to one, one another weekly. But what they would do on those postcards was really similar to the subject matter of this workshop, which, to, which is to take some kind of personal bit of experience and create data out of it and uh, then find a way to, the, to usefully or meaningfully visualize it. And then, then they sent it to one another, literally on a postcard, right? And, um, and so they would do things like, and I'm, I'm totally reaching here, but for example, things like um, when they said goodbye to someone during that week, pay attention to it. Where was it? How, you know, how did it feel? Who did they say goodbye to? Whatever. And then in the process of collecting all that data, you can get some insights out of it and then figure out what makes sense to, um, to show when you make a visualization from it. So, uh, so then, I mean, they actually have a book coming out on this topic and that's got the same name of, of the workshop called observe, collect, draw. And, um, so it was, yeah, it was pretty, pretty fun where, um, sprinkled throughout these, some hands-on experiences, um, the, uh, the instructors would, uh, jo- Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Pasovic, they would, uh, you know, share some theory and like a little bit of lecture here and there of like, um, inspiration styles to consider exa- examples of, of when they think of a, a, you know, what's a, what would be an interesting data source and, and going through it. And the gist of what we did was um, they said, okay, take, pick a data source on your phone and get like 50 or more um, like pieces of data from it, right? So a data source on your phone, explain if you could so elaborate could be, on that. A little bit. Yeah. So it could be things like um, things you took a photo of, um, your your Twitter history, your Instagram history, your um, let's see, music you've listened to, right? And, you know, get, you know, use that as a singular place to get, gather some observations and then um, get sort of, you know, 50 or more um, discrete sort of bits of data and then add attributes to those things, things that you observe about them. Like maybe you want to think about like, why are you listening to these songs or this genre or um, artist or what have you, right? Um, and, and so part of this is, 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 is that sort of thoughtful hunting for like what might be interesting to go dig into and get some insight out of. So continuing on with the, the music yeah. uh, example. Sure what kind of data would I collect on that? Like where I'm listening to it, when I'm listening to it, anything Uh, else? Like you said like 50 points. And where, why? Oh yeah. And so it's, it's not 50 points. So that, so think of that as like, so 50 songs, right? Um, Uh, Okay. And then, and then you're creating these, some attributes on top of that, where some of the attributes would be there already. 
right? Um, it could be the the time in which you listen to the song, and that that could be captured data that just naturally exists, right? Um, and also the genre of the song, right? Th th that's just about what the data is. But then you may think about well, how does it relate to you personally, and then you gather further. Um, further attributes based on like how much do you like this song or are you is, is it a song that you've liked for a long time is it a song you've only recently discovered that kind of thing what mood do you so associate this song something mm. like that okay where, where that's not inherently in the data there um, and then uh, then then you you end up accumulating some a bunch of data points with additional attributes and then you may notice patterns, right? Um, which, um, by the way, the data I ended up picking was I, I happened to notice that I had um, a little, you know, so you like you, know, you see you can see badges on icons, right? You're you know using your phone, the whole badge mechanism is meant to um, to draw attention to an app, and uh, you know, I've, I've it, for me it's still pretty effective. We it's like oh what's going on here this this app this app has a red five on it what does that mean well <laughs> in the case of my on, on my, on my OmniFocus app which I use to overall manage uh, time and attention types of tasks um well I had the number fifty on it right there so I was like okay for me I I only have it advertised tasks that in that badge that are overdue so I'm like well if I want to find something interesting personal that's going on here. I could just go through my tasks and and uh, see what data uh, what I learned from this data. So that's what I did. And then the trick is with this workshop, it's a very analog thing. It's not about um, okay, fire up your favorite spreadsheet app and pump in data, right? Or export data from your you know app A into spreadsheet B, right? Nope. You basically create um, a ledger, um, your own sort of on paper spreadsheet, right? And mm. uh, yeah, and so that's what I did. And so I, I captured kind of like a little blurb as far as what the task what the task is, um, and then why it was late, how long it was overdue, uh, what project it was for, what type of task it was, um, and what do I. And so how do I feel about it? Like, do I want to do this task or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, let's see. And then I did an, uh, um, another column that I ended up not using. And then I ended up reusing it when I was uh, sifting through the data, trying to find meaningful patterns. And so I ended up creating this annotation in that column of uh, this is the general reason why it's um it's like it's the general we I, I don't know why it's kind of funny it's like i it's like i had the two different observations as far as the reason why but the second time i made that observation it was a more grouped one like i could label more things with it ah so in a way it was like a second draft of one of the other columns columns and oh. so uh, oh, so some of the reasons I came up with were uh, capacity. That's why it was overdue. Um, or I didn't remember. I just forgot about this thing. Or it was um, maybe maybe I didn't buy into it. Like I don't really agree with this. <laughs> but it's on my radar to do. Um, and yeah, things like that. Or, or it's just really hard. It's, it's like there's something about it that has, it's, there's a lot of friction to get going on this task. Um, so, and that, that um, and that, but that was an interesting process, both gathering the data manually in, in an analog form and then getting these additional observations, which it's those, that kind of asking why and looking for patterns is where there's probably something interesting to, to base a visualization on. That's at least from, from me going through this workshop. And then um, you did you, yeah. like as another example that I've been I've had on the screen for a little while here. Uh, hmm. One hundred last viewed videos in YouTube. Oh yeah. So, and so you know, like 
a lot of times I'll use YouTube for reference or for entertainment or what have, what have you. And, um, yeah, I, I almost went for that one. Um, uh, and, but, but, and the other one I was debating about was, uh, f uh 50 podcasts I subscribed to, which I don't know if I quite subscribed to 50, but, um, all right. Well, can you explain? I I I got the post up. Can you explain what this next part is, where we have these these, these uh, columns right here? The Fifty oh, overdue tasks. Oh gosh. Well, yeah. That's that's kind of what I was going into a little bit before. Where, yeah. um. So this is that manual spreadsheet, right? Okay. Yeah. And so there's and there's multiple columns of thinking about like, well, what is the what is the task? And then, as you go to the right, there's those those other columns as far as like why it was late. Um, version one of that is and is the second column then version two of that is the last column the far right uh, where i was able to group it better but then how long it was overdue is another thing so i, I found mm -hmm. this i found this pattern between the how long it was overdue and how do i feel about it that really stood out to me of like hey wait a minute there's there's a situation of like i don't feel too hot about a lot of these that are 28 but wait a minute that's not all this matches my assumption with this pattern I thought I would find. I have things that are 28 days overdue or more that I actually feel good about, like mm -hmm. that I really want to do. So wait a minute, what's up, what's up with that? So then that's where I started to dig into more about like, well, why is this? So in the how do I feel about it ca uh, column, you have it by a number system. It's, it's uh, rated one to five. Yeah. And so, so five meaning like you really don't want to do it. One means no. you really want to do it or the other way. Opposite. Yeah. Opposite. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I'm looking at that. I'm seeing a whole bunch of 28 days out ones that have four and five under motivation. Well, they're very And So yeah, I circled them in green to help me visually just quickly scan this too. Where mm -hmm. I noticed like, I feel really good about some of these things that are really over two or that, that I'd like would love to, 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 um, exp you know, I want to do that task. So yeah, that's, um, and then, and then, so that left me wondering, so wait a minute, why, why would that be right? And so a lot of that ended up being, well, there's a capacity issue with these fours and fives or, um, they're just, yeah, stuff I'm totally all in want to do. But, um, <clears throat> some of them, I noticed that there's another reason why I didn't do it. So what we can get into, like, I've, I created a little key of reasons in the visualization that we can, we can take a look mm. at. In a little bit yeah I, i've got am i looking at that right now oh yeah you're so you're down on the, the the visualization now yeah yeah so if you look at so on the way to the visualization was figuring out like a way to a way to show this but like following the style guide of the instructors it was it wasn't about being my typical go-to is just well all right, tell a story make it an illustration and 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 use uh recognizable uh, visual symbols and just explore which ones are the most clear and have a language that just um, I, I find entertaining or especially easy to, to understand. Right. And so yeah. I'm looking I, at him now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Big feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And okay. yeah. So, but, but those were more literal, right. Where it's, 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 you know, yeah, it's symbolic, but it's a, it's a symbol that is, um it's not as abstract as a simple shape right which is which is where i ended up landing for the final visualization so if you look at the key in the final vis visualization which that's the second image in that that last bit that you've pulled up there ah here we go yeah yep. so then there's kind of two big buckets reasons why things are overdue there's the roadblocked bucket and then the classic procrastination bucket so it's in other words it's like i'm stuck and i want to do this or I just don't want to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I can be stuck because I'm intimidated or I forgot, or it's logistics. It's just, there's a lot of planning to make this happen or it's capacity. Right. Um, and then, and so the, if you look, there's kind of a relationship between the symbols I drew in the prior exploration and how I ended up landing on like, um, like intimidated. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. um right i chose a triangle right triangles are sharp and dangerous as we all know <laughs> yeah um so i was noticing that too and that capacity and taxing task are the same symbol but but uh, on different axes yeah and yep 
so then let's big see. feelings is a round shape and forgot is a round shape yep logistics and didn't buy in are both uh cross shapes hmm. and, and due to time i didn't make a symbol for every single reason and so then mm -hmm. i just made things with a little filled in dot are one of the other reasons <laughs> Okay, so so seeing this, seeing this key now, we can look at the visualization you did. Right, right, right. Okay. So, how do we decode this? I'm curious about your first impressions. You're you're taking a look so at it. Do the task. Okay, so like the the the, the x axis, or no, this would be the y axis. This is going yeah. up down. Is a measurement of how much you want to do the task. Mm -hmm. So like the the very bottom baseline, not at all top line very very much also marked by uh increasing number of lines so like on not at all level it's just like a single dash as you get higher it gets a double dash triple dash quadruple dash five dashes all stacked right very much and that's the same same as the rating system right that's one to five and and then as we go across the x-axis we've got oh how overdue it is yeah as it gets more overdue I see that, okay, going up to the things that you very much want to do, uh, the less overdue things were things you simply forgot, whereas as we get to the most overdue things, it becomes capacity or intimidation. That's not right. you. And or then logistics. one level yeah. down, level four things that you like really want to do, maybe not the most want to do, we run into situations where it's a lot of forgetting, and as we get midway, like as it gets further out, as it becomes more overdue, there's like a little bit of forgetting and a little bit of logistics. And then boom, at the end, once again, we've got capacity, intimidation, and a little bit of logistics. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. And so that overdue thing, the 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 X axis, right, as it's going across, it's um each each available region within that circle equals a day, right? So it goes one day, seven day, fourteen day, twenty-eight day. Gotcha. And then interesting. And then in the middle tier, like in level three desire, I'm not seeing any uh, of these symbols. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, wait a minute. So what is this middle row of symbols with a circle? Okay, the middle row with the circle as far as yeah. the, that's just, that. that's visualizing how overdue it is, right? Okay, okay, <clears throat> gotcha. So the, 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 there's essentially four levels of overdue. There's one day overdue, seven days overdue, 14 that, days overdue and then right okay so i heard it when you said that and i didn't immediately associate that those circles were associated with that got it because mm -hmm. they're because they're running across the middle instead of the bottom and totally. i would yeah so i would expect to find them on the bottom as like part of the x-axis but no that totally makes sense and so now we get into like a whole bunch of other reasons why these are overdue when you get to level three that's pretty interesting like as you're more neutral about uh the project yeah it becomes it becomes less about capacity less about logistics less about forgetting but other reasons that are, are making them overdue yeah that yeah oh. i found that interesting too um the more clear reasons or the the reasons that had uh i guess enough frequency where i made symbols for them had happened at the i don't know when the stakes were higher i guess um and not surprising when you get down to like level one and level two desire, we fall into classic procrastination concerns um, and, and some big feelings as we get to things that are really far, far away. Uh, big feelings and intimidation. Huh. Neat. So yeah, it's, it's giving you like a, a very at a glance, very, like, as somebody who's very visually oriented, this is like a great way to tell yourself a story about what you've been doing. I mean, this is uh, along the lines of what I try to do in my ETP with color coding things so I can quickly go back and review things. But this gives you like sort of like a, like you said, a 28 day overview. Hmm. Yeah. And, and this is, I, I felt a lot more informed. Um, I thought, yeah, who knows? I had an impish. I'm like, this is funny. It's a little bit of like, um, like this set of tasks I've been, I had been sort of, you know, uh, delaying, putting off, punting, whatever. And I would have, n without this workshop, I, I don't think I would have dug into this to find out more of the reasons why that this stuff is overdue. 
Mushin girls in the chat and is asking, would you <laughs> anticipating where we're going to go? Uh, would you consider utilizing some of these icon doodle notes in some daily journal form like the immersion task planner? And yeah, I could see this like so like something I used to do in my ETP was keep a, uh, a page that I called holding, which is sort of like a um, barf out everything that I'd like to do in the next week on this sheet. And and also like use it as a collection sheet. So like anything that's happening during the week that like becomes like a one of the various emergent tasks. Like it just becomes this like messy holding tank for everything that I want to do. I could imagine adding a new sheet in the in the the rotation that does something like this. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like at the end of the month, like at the end of every month, do one of these visualizations of everything that happened in the month. And it's, what's interesting too is is uh, there's a different mode. Like if you look at the 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 sort of uh, the doodle notes that I took as the class was going on, right? So go, going to the top of the post that that top introductory, yeah, um, set of um, doodles and notes. Like that's that's the kind of thing that I will, yeah, I'll capture this, and we'll we're going to talk a lot more about this format in the second half, right? And. Okay. Um, this is a thing where I'm producing this where I am absorbing and not doing heavy processing. So I'm um, some learning materials being shared, or I'm listening to an audiobook. I've done this a few of in you know in, in those kind of cases too, but typically it's if I attend an event and I want to make sure that um it's like I'm making more connections in my brain, I'll do this kind of note taking. Whereas the um like describing the adventure of that uh, that workshop and going through like a, a summary of it, right? The observe, collect, draw workshop that was super active, right? And so, and what's funny is is um, uh, let's see. You, I mean, so your question, uh, Mushin girl, was um, it's almost like a combination of those two, and that's really interesting because it's it's saying that uh somehow you could you could sift through and have like this visual reaction to your day but maybe not doing as deep of a dive into the data right and um because that that deep dive into the data that's the critical thing that that um came out of the workshop of uh, observe collect draw um that it it just feels so different doing I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just Captain Obvious level observation, but like be, write, writing it all down, which is like inherently inefficient, right? So like <laughs> the... the um, Let's go back to the, the spreadsheet that you made, <laughs> all right? Yeah. Here I we mean, are. <laughs> this is like the person, the, the part of me that like, likes to automate stuff and avoid extra work, right? I was like, oh, this is extra work. Ugh. This is this hurts almost doing a spreadsheet like that, but inherently, I was cr much like cr capturing those visual notes. I was creating more connections and experiences with the data as I was going because I was I was um, creating a, a new personal connection with all of it, and that led to it being a little bit easier doing the summarizing and then thinking about how do I want to visualize it and digging in deeper. But, um, but I think that's the, I don't know that, what do you think is, is that, what do you think of the, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, if, if my memory is correct from a few moments ago, uh, I corrected myself when I said, like, I could see doing this weekly, no monthly, <laughs> cause like if, if I saw, if, if I could see doing it at some kind of like good summary point at like after in my ETP, um, at the end of a month because like as you pointed out like there's there's a lot of data collecting that happens here and i don't think i don't i don't necessarily trust myself to capture my motivations in the moment when things are happening um sometimes it's 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 just the, it's enough of a demand for me to capture the activity itself in my etp when the when the thing is happening um and i try to capture in a little bucket at the bottom of each daily page like i say what good happened i try to capture a few observations about moments that give me some kind of context for what was happening on that day but i'm not even always successful at that so doing these assignments of icons on a daily basis sounds super daunting to me but as a if i were to introduce a monthly self meeting i already do a weekly self meeting on sundays but if i did a monthly one and did something similar to this and 
it wouldn't be as deep a dive because it'd only be 30 days back, and it would be uh, something that I was um, consistently revisiting in, with regard to the work that I'm doing. I could see doing it that way, right? Mm -hmm. But um, are you are you going to incorporate something like this into your yearly planning and review session that you do with Kate? Oh, <laughs> uh, possibly. I so I kind of um, well a couple of years ago. Um, so no, it was, yeah, right at the beginning of 2016, I took a, I did a reflective exploration of 2015 and it, we talked about this and I did a thing called uh, that I called uh, my experience inventory. And I gathered like 200 some different data points with, with, uh, what was it? Was it 19 or 20 observations each? So it literally adds up to like individual, like X, Y coordinate data points of like over 4,000. Right. And it was uh, really, 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 really arduous to gather all that data. And, um, but I was looking to triangulate and, and get sort of like, um, get out of my own head kind of clarity from, here's a bunch of experience. I have feelings about it. I can talk about that anytime. But what about when I turn it into data? Can I get, and, it, and then purposefully turn it at different angles. Like for that, it was like, are these experiences, how are they affecting me personally? What about the people I'm trying to serve? And, and then how does it relate to categories of, of um, how I think about activities in my life related to, is it, you know, family, um, health, finance, um, you know, personal, uh, let's see, is it a, uh, what kind of professional commitment is it? All that kind of stuff. And that was so much work that I, I did not repeat it the next year or the year after. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what we're, so part of it too is like if you're going to have something that you bring into your process and it's going to serve you regularly, um, like, you know, finding a way, finding a, an appropriate fit for um, like how much, how much effort you know, do you want to put in before you learn if you're going to learn something out of this, right? And so, so saying essentially, maybe up to 50 data points and doing some exploration as an experiment, because maybe it's quarterly, right? So maybe after mm. three quarters of effort, you like, for instance, your ETP or your daily journal, what have you, would have enough data that is, um, you know, not too arduous to explore. And, uh, then you can, you know, do an experiment, right? And see what, see what comes out of it and even stop at 50 or 20 or 40 data points and see how it goes. Right. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I would add this to, uh, I could see doing this yearly, but I would purposefully try to not be as granular as I was before. Right. And so it's kind of like, yeah, I could see dialing it in and and seeing how it goes but um, well I, I i would imagine well you could tell me because you, you perhaps you could speak to this better because you actually went through the experience i'm you know speculating based on what you're describing but you're describing i have 50 tasks in OmniFocus, which is like a broad uh spectrum of different activities that you are engaged in right and i saw yeah. even in the in the post there was like different uh definitions of activity like this was a design activity this was an admin activity and so on mm -hmm. um but if you were to narrow that scope down to i'm just going to talk about my comics production right like and and like i have two different comics categories i have like personal comics categories freelance comic categories okay we're just going to focus on freelance this month how did i do on that how how did i ship everything on time or uh did i ship everything under my time budget if not let's look at what was happening like what's, what, what kind of information can I gather from what was happening around me that affected whether or not I shipped under my time budget? Totally. And, and like, if you can find personal, personal connection to each of those pieces of data, um, like, like what they mean to you or, um, you know, find, you know, find dimensions that, that are beyond the, the, um, like the the environmental phenomena kind of observations right where oh it happened at this time and this is what it is and that kind of stuff 
Um, but it's more like also relating that to you and how, uh, like, did you feel prepared, rate, get, a, get a preparedness rating, right? Um, get a uh, joyful rating, um, that kind of thing. And now mm -hmm. all of a sudden you've got these, these really personal connections that uh, probably lead to something that where you'll, as you're going through and per purposefully personally touching all this data, um, you, you, you'll notice some patterns or you'll guess, is this a pattern? And then there won't be a pattern. <laughs> and then you, but you'll right. find something as you're guessing and, and exploring and playing with it. Oh, that's awesome. I, uh, you know, yeah. I think I've been out twice for IO and I still haven't gone to IO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's, yeah, that's, it's, um, it's not a free event. So uh, there's, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, an expense that, that, you know, they, navigating that is a big deal. And that was actually mentioned, um, there in one of the talks I went to this year where, um, you know, IO is, uh, is, <laughs> it's not cheap. And one of the, one of the speakers commented about that and, and said that that probably affects, well, it, it affects who can attend and all that and whatever. And I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't know. That, that's, yeah, there's that, been that's a, uh, like the, 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 I've, I missed the first couple few years of IO because it morphed from a, an event that used to be called Flash Belt. And it was it was kind of like this community that was into uh, interactivity and data and design, whatever. But like because of Adobe Flash and it was a very empowering, creative coding kind of tool. Right. Um, and it was out of that community part of it that, that what led to IO and uh yeah, I wasn't. I I couldn't quite justify the business expense for the first few years of the event when it's transitioned from Flash Belt to IO. Because and yeah. this is this is totally a sidebar, but this is just like a um, this is a, a really interesting tension to navigate. In that, if you make it free and completely open to the public, then it becomes difficult to get people to get the right amount of people, or the right uh, proportion of people who are really invested in all in on it. Mm -hmm. And when you make the price high enough, then everybody who's there really, really freaking wants to be there. But now you've closed the door to a potential group of people who really want to be there, but don't have the resources to pay to get in. So like figuring out like the sweet spot in there is super hard. It's not a simple thing. Not at all. And this year uh, they did actually um, work with one of the sponsors where there were scholarships. So there's, oh, that's great. It is, um, it is possible to be a volunteer and also get scholarships so there, i mean there's there's a there there are other scrappy ways to attend but um that's great yeah all right well do, are, do you think it's time to go into the second half of the show take a break for a minute and... yeah totally i uh to, well to um sort of close off the this section and think about like i know like our, our kind of umbrella is like doodle notes and and data and, and reflecting and stuff um i and that question from motion girl was super super timely and, and insightful where um, there's there's a lot to this where you know we we just described like a purposely trying to get um, uh, get into the data aspect of it and that's a very active thing and it's kind of like you may gather data and then it, you you purposely scan through it and it washes over you but like you're so active and and exploring in that and it's not a it's not a situation where you're you're sitting back hearing a a, a lecture seeing someone share work and insights and presentation right and that's the different that's that's like where we're going to dive into next is is more the um taking notes as a in effort to remember better what uh, what you experienced as opposed to like like in a way you're creating a, a new experience when you're doing all this data concerned work. Thank you for that, that contextualizing of what we're doing right now, Rob. That's great. Um, yeah. So in, in a minute and 30 seconds, we're going to focus more on note taking and uh, the way that Rob's been taking notes. And I can say that when Rob was out here for a two calf, even we were, when we were socializing, the note, uh, note cards were out and the pen was moving even when having casual conversations. And uh, <sighs> I got to the well, point where, people joke and stuff right but that's not a joke though I'm, i speak with admiration when i say this i got another buddy in town who does this whenever i hang out with him 
I mean, it, it's actually, it's like a really awesome visual feedback because it like, it's like, oh, I just said something interesting because I saw the pen move. <laughs> uh. So even if the face doesn't give me a tell, the hand's giving a tell. Like whatever I'm saying, it's it's triggering something. That's cool. I know that I'm I'm not being a bore, you know? So, um, yeah. And I, and I also admire the fact that you can do that so fluidly while still carrying on a conversation with people. Um, but anyway, we'll talk more about like, how you think about it, uh, and maybe if I have any thoughts on it, I'm sure I will, uh, in a minute and 30 seconds. But before we do that, we have to thank some uh, people who make this show possible, and those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to support the show on a monthly basis. You know, as little as a dollar a month, say that you believe in us, and you believe in the material, the, the products that we make. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash lean into art. And we want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that. First up, Robert Clemens, Rob Clemens Jr. on Twitter, longtime supporter of the show and uh, supporter on Twitter. Thank you, Robert, for believing in us. Uh, Brandon Dayton, Brandon Dayton, who was on the show recently at Brandon Dayton on Twitter. Also, Green Monk is up for pre-order now. I'll remind you of that pre-order code. It's APR188362. APR 188362. You won't remember it. We'll link to it in the show notes. And then also, good to be curious. Good to be curious. Thank you for believing in us and believing in the stuff that we do. Uh, you can find good to be curious at good to be curious on Twitter. Also, Bouncy McFluff Fluff. Thank you, Bouncy. Uh, we still don't know your Twitter handle, but we love your name. And finally, Casey Snipes at letter K, letter C, Snipes on Twitter, longtime supporter of the show. You could join them at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows that we make as well as the Extra Leans, the shows we record just for leaners. It's only for patrons. And, uh, you know, it's Rob and I riffing live, and you can use that post as an open mic post where you can talk about whatever you want with fellow leaners. And we thank everybody who has been supporting us there, patreon.com slash leanintoart. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It means a lot to us. All right. Here we go. Time to talk about note taking capturing ideas I caught the reference in, uh, in the Rockets book what? it's, uh, Which one? what's it was it a bird that yells go 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 right oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, the duck when he's watching a rocket take off totally referring to go fever um yeah so uh we're ready to talk about Note taking now. Where do you yeah. want to start? Um, let's see. I don't. I. I think this is this is nothing new. We've talked about different uh, sort of uh, the like the virtues of, of of doodling and and journaling and all that this kind of stuff. And have mentioned books like uh, Suni Brown's Doodle Revolution or Mike Rohde's uh, Sketch Note Handbook, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, there's there are handy resources if you're thinking about like. Um, maybe it's natural for you to, to take visual notes, but then it's like, what, how could you amp them up to, um, just get, get more encoded in there and all that stuff. I mean, so, so th those are good, um, both really good resources to, uh, to check out. Um, and sometimes if, um, uh, uh, so how often, like when you're, when you when you're doing a when you're capturing a thought about i don't know and you're going to turn it into something visual maybe it's on a whiteboard maybe it's on a chalkboard um how often like do you do you go like very representative and concrete always or do you sometimes go iconic and abstract um and and or do you float back and forth i'm trying to think well I've got my bag right behind me and it has my my note card uh wallet that I use. And I can find out. Okay. Because yeah, the um if you're in a situation capturing you know, capturing notes and ideas about whatever you're experiencing, uh chances are if you're trying to go extra detailed representative, uh you will probably capture less information, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very like there's oh yeah the great yes. drawings that I'm doing. <laughs> they they are great. Like that was a bear, like straight up. Here's a little sure. iconic bear. 
but it's it's definitely stick figure level right totally it's it's the ideas right the right. the the rough the rough concept gets you know get, gets a uh, representation um and i mean I, and i guess that's that's kind of the mode i'm in and i i freely i freestyle will be combining uh visual symbols and words um and uh and what's funny is I, I float back and forth where if I do this in natural media or iPad, so this, this works if you're, you know, you're working digitally or, or not. Um, this year at, at IO, um, I was all digital, but then last year checking out my notes, cause I know I have five years of these notes, right? Um, I, it's almost like I've gone every other year going back and forth between being uh, digital or analog. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I didn't plan on that. <laughs> so um what I'll uh what I'll typically try to do is 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 uh, okay I'm going to attend someone's specific talk and I try to get some little title cardish thing represented somewhere in this uh in the layout um so if we're um if if you're checking out the post IO 2018 sketches and doodle notes I'm um, pulling that up now yeah you'll see like a gallery of um uh, where, where it's essentially one note per per talk I was I attended, except for the evening talks because it was it's a little hard um, if you think about you're going to be in an auditorium and taking notes and if those are going to be digital and then like let's say the lighting's really dark well now you are the person in the theater with your phone out right kind of thing um, and I I was like yeah this isn't going to work for me right because yeah sure the iPad I could work in you know, near darkness because it has its own, it's backlit. No problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, except it just didn't, it doesn't feel polite. So I did not. Yeah. I was going to say, that would be my next question is how do you feel about being around a bunch of strangers with this big 12 inch light up screen in your lap? Yeah. Especially I do have uh, Yeah. I've got the, the whatever 2016 iPad pro, which was, that is a, that, that's a, that's a big screen. Yeah, pretty bright. So, anyway, um, so here we are. I've got the the drawings pulled up. All right. So yeah. So we're you checking out? Um, okay. So picking. Uh, okay. So you have the uh, what is Anne Marie Thomas? Uh, the work of play. Uh, mm -hmm. One pulled up there, and so you you know there's the title card, and I try to make it somehow easily to to find it out now oftentimes i'll include some you know really uh stick figure -y doodle of the uh, uh of the presenter and uh then you know the, the title and their name and whatnot and then from there it's it's sort of things spiral spiral out and it's it doesn't have to go in time order uh and you know i would not be able to recreate their talk and whatnot from from this other than i could I can unpack it a lot easier than if I was just looking at like, oh, here's the here's the um, the agenda for IO and or whatever conference I was at, and start trying to pull out points from just pure memory, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, oh yeah, I knew I was at Anne Marie Thomas's talk, but then, gosh, where did it start, and what where where do I go next? Whereas here, I've got tons of hints I can just dive into, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And, uh, and I think about now, like, for instance, looking at this, you know, my memory is jogged where I, I um, a lot of Anne Marie Thomas's story was about how through, through her academic career, she found, found ways to um, explore things that she was passionate about, but not necessarily achieving like high academic status, but um, able to um, you know, pursue and explore things like uh, within, you know, in, for instance, um, uh, like she was at, uh, let's see, for instance, she was at, she, she was at MIT, she was at Caltech, and in both places, there was kind of a playfulness theme to, um, you know, like when she was um, exploring a topic. And I'm trying to remember where she was when she started, she started a multidiscipline group to study gravity as a way to um, get into very detailed understandings of physics. Right. And so instead of, um, you know, 
working through um, even simulations of problems and whatnot with computers, um, they went to this this uh, um, acrobatic gym, right? And they were jumping on trampolines and then trying to figure out, do, then do the calculations to figure out what were the forces at work there, right? Mm. And that and here we have a little stick figure jumping on a trampoline and it just says to steady gravity and, start, and started a multidisciplinary group to study gravity like yeah. boom there's like image and word to like sort of re-trigger the memory of the thought for you right totally and and then what i've also noticed um so i was i was sitting next to someone who uh, you know, because you run into lots of other friendly folk when you go to an event like this. I imagine part of the reason you do this, I know for, for me too, is to just meet other people, right? And uh, who are probably into some similar things. And this person asked me a question about a talk I was at, and, and I just was like, oh gosh, let me let me remember. And then I, so I pulled up my sketch notes, and uh, they were looking over over my shoulder, and they and they had a visceral reaction where it was, um, I'm trying to remember, was it, um, oh yeah, Nathaniel Raymond's talk about big data disasters. Okay, and um, there was this point, this uh, part of the talk where, Here you go. Uh, it's part of the point of this is this was well, Nathaniel's, um, um, you know, thesis and th ideas he was sharing with us was uh, gathering data can have, um, can have a lot of effects. Um, it can really affect the people that it's about because, you know, if who's in power is using it to, to serve them or to not serve them or, you know, to purpose through, or to, you know, maybe even harm, right? It's, it's, uh, I mean, data is a, is a, is a pretty, um, a, a pretty powerful to human tool to, to engage with. And one of the early, I cannot remember exactly at what point in history this was, but there was this, um, there was a king who asked, um all of his generals to go uh gather an arrowhead for each of their soldiers right and that kind of gave a representation of of like how big each of these different um players in in that political you know structure were right and then and it gave a basis to to measure like well are you growing right so what happened is each each of these um different generals would carry, you know, come back with a, you know, a big load of, of arrowheads and th they would get melted down in this thing called uh, the cauldron, the, the cauldron of Ariantes, which uh, is a, in a pretty cool name. Um, and, and that was, uh, and so <laughs> he made a pun out of this, but it's awesome. So those arrowheads were like the first data points. <laughs> oh. it's, uh, that's pretty, but it's true because, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, her, her, uh, uh, a pun that you know one needs to be safe with because you want to slap your forehead or whatever but <laughs> um but you melt those down and all of a sudden like there's summarized data physical data um here's a here's a um a brick of metal that represents you know this piece of the kingdom kind of thing anyway um but then and there's so th a, this person yeah. had a visceral reaction looking over your shoulder at the, at the Ex sketch notes exactly and then we were able and he he started to to tell the story of the story the the cauldron of Ariantes or whatever right in just from yeah noticing this little bubbly cauldron and then you know and and so my belief totally not researched no science behind this or whatever is that these kind of notes are really all about the note taker and then maybe other people who attended the same thing right mm. and then uh, primarily secondarily they might be kind of fun for for the curious but like it's not going to have the same level of um uh m it, information in it so that's right so it, that, yeah. and that takes the pressure off for sure in taking this kind of notes because yes if if it's uh, this is the analogy i can think of is when i tell my students about thumbnailing on sticky notes I'm like, it's not important that I can tell what these markings mean. It's important that you, the author, know what these markings mean. This is a mm -hmm. reference point for you to get to your second round of thumbnails, right? So. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you're front-loading a lot of thinking into this thing. And you, you're not going to be in the moment when you do that. Yeah, and you, you that's, uh, yeah, a really key aspect of this is 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 being in the moment right where 
not, I don't really know where this is going to go. But then, you know, you end up coming up with, if you practice this over time, you'll, you'll come up with sort of go-to symbols or um, bits or jokes or what have you. And that's, that's actually something I, I want to go back through and mine my own notes to see what, what's kind of like, what's my vocabulary of symbols that I, re, that I reuse over the years. Uh, I know I like to draw satellites. I know I like to draw maps. I know I like to, um, I know I like to draw fish <laughs> um, or the globe, right? So you, here you have the uh, Lindsey Grace, um, which, um, which he presented on um, this idea that games plus, right? So it's play plus blank. And that leads to, you know, there's, there's a lot of spaces that, that games can serve within, uh, whether, um, whether serious or safe ways to explore, you know, emotional topics or, um, even as you're developing, like there's a lot of, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what audience he described they were serving, but, um, uh, but like folks who are, 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 you know, starting to develop and get closer to puberty. And then, then these, uh, these kissing games were, were becoming popular among this population. And, uh, they were all about, um, of, you know, getting, getting the affection of some other desirable party. And how do you get to that stage of the relationship where you kiss? Right. And I was like, this sounds, I, I want to doodle two stick figures awkwardly attempting to kiss right then and so like <laughs> i'm i'm actively <laughs> sifting for these moments where i'm like this is going to make me laugh later um and or just be fun to draw right now <laughs> um right um shadowing tronics uh troy's in the chat room and is asking uh, well, first commenting, then asking, I'm betting nobody in high school borrowed Rob's notes, which is my funny way of asking how he came up with this system or did he, did I miss it? Oh, um, so no, that, that you totally didn't miss it. I mean, I came up with this system as this is my own attempt to, um, apply lessons from, uh, doodle revolution and the, uh, this, the, uh, sketch note handbook. Um, and also just the which was in a way that's like trying to get a little more formal with uh, visual note taking. And those are, those are two great ways to, to get, um, to get a, a formal basis that you can build from because you'll end up, um, you know, you'll end up creating your own recipes and, and symbols that you prefer patterns. But, um, but that's definitely that, that, um, that foundational thing of like getting a nice, nice little title card. Um, that's, 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 I directly picked that up from the sketch note handbook. Um, Which I have up on the then, screen. That's at rowdesign.com slash handbook, R O H design.com slash handbook. Uh, and as far as like cue from, you know, like younger Rob days or whatever, uh, yeah, I mean, I would doodle in school, but then doodling in school sometimes was about wanting to not be there. And this is actually about wanting to be there even harder <laughs> than physically being there where uh it's it's uh it the the physical motion of connecting with capturing notes while listening to a speaker and uh looking up at what visual information they're they're sharing and in this kind of you know rhythmic uh ebb and flow back and forth and it's not, and, and it isn't sort of rhythmic in the, in like a, um, a, the timing of music where it's very specific and in, uh, at a, at a certain frequency, but like, um, you know, sometimes I disappear into the doodle for, for longer than other times. Some, some talks are very dense and are just a constant you know, flood of, of symbols, ideas, information and whatnot. And, and it's, um, that's a different feel. Like if you look at, you know, the, the, those, the, some of these notes, um, some, some presenters would describe some of their work and then share a bit of a video that, um, was really great and, and, and fun to see, but then wasn't very information dense. Um, 
and then yeah and you can get a kind of a feel for for that for for that in a way as as that is indirectly visualized in the notes but um let's see but like there there's definitely that i want to uh put in something that entertains me or is fun or funny like there was like you just there's a trojan horse doodle that looks like a kind of a a, a misshapen giant toy horse right in the one that you you, you were just on where yeah, um right here. and that was during the talk uh whose tools whose house which was a panel that had um uh it was conversation about being thoughtful of when we use platforms to bring things to an audience we're we're involving um you're involving a, a company and its own business model with who you're trying to serve right and and that that may be harmonious that may not be and it's you know being thoughtful about that's um that's important um uh, I have the revolution will not be encrypted by mm -hmm. is it Matt Mitchell? Yeah, Matt Mitchell. And there's a in the bottom of the sketch note is uh, a word balloon that says unseating power is hard, and the character saying it is the Eye of Sauron in the <laughs> Tower from the Lord of the Rings. And like that, see, this is I'm gonna get comics nerdy again. It's like one of the things I love about this kind of storytelling is that. Uh, you can say you take the words unseating power is hard it it does have a um a bend to it but when you make it if you show sour on there that increases the bend by like 60 degrees right <laughs> <laughs> yep. um because not not only are you are you putting a moral idea behind it but you're also showing how insurmountable it is at the same time with a single doodle and sometimes there's a there's a playful inter inter um interaction between the doodles so like the one that you mentioned has the eye of sauron saying saying what it what, what it's saying but then right next to it is a, um is a is a is a shouting stick figure holding a picket sign saying uprisings are the voice of the repressed um pretty much shouting at sauron yeah yeah, um, it's so funny. In the yeah, and seeing this talk, uh, I'm, yeah, f f I highly recommend following Matt Mitchell on Twitter. He's, he has a lot of fascinating work. He does things like uh, um, he does crypto parties and advocacy and education. He does um, the project Crypto Harlem, which isn't just about Harlem, but it's especially for Harlem in in um, the uh, helping uh, educate and assist a population that is um, overly surveilled, and how can they, you know. Um, you know, work and live safely in that, in that environment. Mm. So, yeah. So you meet lots of, in, in, and learn from a lot, a lot, lot of very, um, uh, like, yeah, people doing some really great work and it's. And in the bottom right corner, demand ethics are taught and then there's Goku fire behind it. <laughs> <laughs> There's there's plenty of little uh, passages surrounding it. Maybe there's a box around it. Maybe there's brackets around it. But no, demand ethics are taught. Has like, yeah, that's that's like Super Saiyan fire. Yeah, there's fire in that one. Yeah, it's it's meant to be. Yeah, it's intense. So, like, yeah, I'm curious about any of any other um, any re other reactions or. Um, um, well, it's it's. It's something that I would imagine most of the people who pay attention to what we do are do some kind of visual stuff, right? Visual storytelling, visual communication, whether it's design or whether it's drawing or whether it's comics, whether it's you know coding. Um, so I'd imagine that this mode of communication probably feels fairly natural to a lot of the people who are listening. Um, it, well, however, and, yes, yeah, go ahead. But, Oh, I, habitualizing it, I think, is is the interesting question. Like when, when, when to. So I, I wonder if I'm, I'm going to tee up what I think could be a good final thought. Mm. Any thoughts on when it's appropriate to do this and when it's not, and measuring your reaction to you, you said you've oscillated back and forth year to year of doing it on paper and doing it on a digital device. 
And I'm wondering if you could give some sense of like pros and cons to each or uh, a sense of like what tools you've used in those different instances. Um, that's a lot of final thoughts. So you could always pick yeah, and choose kind of which one of those sounds final like. thoughts. It uh, kind of is. So yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's see what, let's see what stands out <laughs> and All right. we'll, we'll roll with, roll with those three. Um, I'd want to mention shadow wing tronics shared in the, in the chat. I've seen commentary and trivia videos that do stuff like that images on the screen to go along with what the host is saying. And ultimately that's one of my motivations for doing this is I do enjoy, I, um, you know, for, for day job and, and that, that kind of stuff. I do sometimes play the role of like a, a, a visual facilitator or visual note taker for like a whole group and using the a combination of words and symbols. It's, it's exactly this method, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's doing this for a group on a larger surface typically. Um, and there are videos that, um, uh, let's see who's it's super funny. This, this is a thread I intend to pull more on. So maybe we can revisit this in future episodes, like especially that, that live aspect of it. Um, and I think like this is, this has existed, um, since I think, I, I think there are vaudeville examples of this and early animation examples. Really? Yeah. Um, I've heard lightning sketchers. I think there's problematic exam examples from there that are, you know, oh, racist dear. and stuff, but, um, mm -hmm. the technique, um, seems to originate from there. Um, again, I'm pulling on a thread. I think the thread goes a lot deeper. We'll see, but, uh, I would be a lot of fun to revisit this in maybe a historical context and also, um, you know, other, um, other contexts like you know, like doing this while you're streaming on a video or you know with a group on a big uh on a big surface somehow okay yeah um i was trying to find my slide that i use in a lot of my talks and presentations where i take a line of dialogue three times and then i just change the balloons around each oh i love that love that example yeah, yeah it's it's uh it's it's one that that with new audiences, it's like very effective to say like, okay, all I'm going to do is change the shape and the line and watch what happens. And you, you won't be able to unsee this. You're going to start noticing it on everything, you know? And it's like the first one, I put a smooth balloon. The second one, I put a pointy balloon. The third one, I put like a drippy, slimy balloon. And I asked the audience to read it aloud, you know? And they always read it, calm voice, screaming voice, undead voice, you know? Like, so I changed the shape and the line and you hear different voices in your heads, you know? And if that's not magic, I don't know what is. I mean, it really, to me, that feels like a true magic trick. You can manipulate the voices people hear. And I feel like that's kind of the same idea of what's happening with when you're sketch noting like this too, is um, you're adding a visceral level of emotional transfer in the collecting of the, uh, of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. There's, yeah, the, the, the purposefully using the, the visual, uh, visual symbols to convey more information and definitely way more emotion and and uh, hopefully that it's it's easier to recall as uh, as a byproduct all right so. well uh if you want to ruminate on what you think of those three options i presented you uh make an, a more interesting final thought um, i can kick off our last break of the episode and we'll come back in about a minute, minute, two minutes to, you know, wrap up this episode with the final thought. What do you say? Sounds excellent. All right. So it's time to thank some other people who make the show possible. Those people happen to be us. We make the show. We also make and design things that inform our thinking to bring to the show. And the thing that I hope you will check out that I make is uh, actually I co-created this book with my wife, Anne. It's called Science Comics Rockets, Defying Gravity. It's been out for a couple weeks now. It's in stores all over the uh, North America, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon, but you can also get it at your local bookstore or com comic book store. And if you go to sciencecomicsrockets.com, you'll find out about our book tour dates. We're going to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, oh, we already did that one. That one's passed. <laughs> this weekend, we're going to be in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the Vault of Midnight. And then we're going to be a ner at Nerd Camp. We're going to be in Petoskey. We're going to Connecticut. We're going to the Carytown Book Festival. And uh, even more, 
Uh, you, you can check out sciencecomicsrockets.com for, uh, for the dates on that. What is it about? It's the history and science of rockets as told by the animals who participated in rocket history. It is a comics documentary. So you will learn how rockets work. You will learn about the history of rockets. And you will learn all these interesting stories of animals who participated in the development of machines that fly into outer space. And yes, everybody says, yes, space monkeys and space dogs. Yes, that's true. But also space tortoises, space quails, space spiders, um, <laughs> bears in ejector seats, uh, ducks, roosters, and sheep in hot air balloons, um, rats with parachutes. And that's at sciencecomicsrockets.com. Rob, you make a game. Oh, it's a sun, su such a fun book. And uh, yeah, the game I make is called uh, This Panda Needs You. Well, and what's interesting is uh, this was a collaboration with my, with my wife. Uh, she co-designed it. Um, so what's this game about? Uh, it's a it's a pattern matching puzzle uh, block stacking game where uh, you are here to help this, uh, this cute little panda who shows up in a bamboo forest with uh, some blocks all stacked up and they look fine, right? But then a cloud comes along and messes it all up. And it's up to you to help the panda put things back to the way they should be. And, you know, along the way, the panda dances and celebrates. There's mellow, happy music, and it's just a very gentle kind of game. Uh, there's over 50 levels to, to play, and uh, they're, they're handled in sort of 10 levels at a time where that's sort of like a little play session. So if you're, you know, if you're playing this game with little ones or whatnot, it's a nice way to, to help with uh, regulating like what feels like a complete uh, experience, right? So it's not, oh, time to play through 50 levels, right? Um, just 10 at a time. Then the panda goes back in her little house and takes a break. It's really cute. Mm. So um, yeah, it's available for iPhone, iPad, uh, Android phones, tablets, uh, Windows, and Mac desktop. For the desktop versions, go to itch.io and search for This Panda Needs You. And for uh, the other versions, go to your store of choice, whether that be iTunes or uh, Google Play. And if you have purchased it, thank you for doing so. Uh, but the next thing you can do, if you haven't done this already, is giving the game a rating in the store in which you purchased it. Five-star rating or a nice review helps more people find the game. Um, mm -hmm. If you are here because you like this, the way we think about stuff and you're not, so, not quite as interested in the stuff we make, that's fair enough. This show is a thing that we make. And there's more stuff like that at leanintoart.com slash workshops. I know that there are people who still haven't downloaded uh, our video workshops there because I still get notifications every week of a new couple downloads of Comics Fundamentals or FATAM. And uh, which, which is to say, when I say downloads, that means that they downloaded it at a price of their choosing. They chose to just have it for free. And so you can download it for free right now. If you do get some value out of it, a great thing you could, you could do is uh, purchase it afterwards and maybe get it as a gift for a friend. It's like giving us a tip for making stuff that you found valuable and you're helping out a buddy saying, hey, I got something out of this. Maybe you will too. That's at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And if you're watching this video on YouTube right now, giving it a thumbs up helps more people find the show. Or if you're listening to it in a podcatcher like Apple Podcasts, giving the show a five-star review helps more people find the show. We appreciate everybody who's doing all those things. Uh, it means a lot to us. It does. Thank you very much. Final thought time? Final thought time. All right. So, I mean, you, you asked uh, three different questions and I think a couple of them really do fit together quite naturally. Like, uh, like how would you go about habitualizing this? And, uh, for me, it's, it started with, um, uh, really wanting to go from the kind of note taking that I, that I did before. And I, I've done it for, for, for years and years, actually before, before, you know, I ever attended IO or flash belt or whatever, but um, you know, I'd fill up like moleskin notebooks and stuff. And I wanted, to, but at a certain point I, I, I thought this could be a little more of a document and might be more fun to reflect on more fun to share and, and as it's panned out, I have I have benefited from that. But like it really ramped up once I decided I wanted to to have that end product be probably more shareable and at least more beneficial to you know maybe interesting or entertaining or a point of, a way a place to start a conversation with others who weren't there. But definitely for for folks who were at an event that I was at, then you know hopefully they would actually. Um, recall more. And so just that desire, it's like, 
then it then it's going from being more formal. It's like if you're already into note taking, this is a little bit different than just regular note taking because you know it's it's saying that well, I'm probably going to work within some constraints of a page or a screen, right? And um, and I want to get it done during the whole during the event. And so if these constraints seem appealing, like habitualizing it, it habitualizing this no, kind of note taking, um, I mean, it, it comes from now, you know, going forth and taking notes during a thing, right? And that's um, like one of the, one thing I did a while back, and I know it's, it's, it's on interactive-storyteller.com is I did a, I did a sketch note for the movie uh, double impact. <laughs> and so you could do this during a movie. You could do this during like just YouTube videos or whatever. Uh, chances are the shorter, the shorter, the thing, uh, honestly, the more Spartan your note's going to be, right? So if you have a, a big piece of paper and you're, you're, you're doing a, you know, doodle style visual note taking for like a, you know, a five or seven minute YouTube video, eh, it's just probably not going to fill up a lot. But uh, but that's okay. It doesn't have to. But maybe you'd want to use a smaller piece of paper or something for you know, because in a way time is implied with that. But uh, jumping into it, I think is all about just saying, well, this thing I'm experiencing, I'm going to go for it. And there really isn't a lot of barriers there to just um, seeing what kind of um, things you want to capture and then just capturing it as you go and getting used to this kind of um, hey, I'm, I'm capturing a thing and I want to do it pretty quickly. And there's going to be this natural experience of like, I'm not looking at the thing I'm here to listen to and whatnot as well. So it's, there's this back and forth with the presentation, the media, what have you, that, um, you know, you'll, you'll get to, to experience as you, you know, jump in, um, Lastly, I think uh, I, I I've gained a lot when I go to an event where it's where it's sort of a, a conference, where I know that I'll be at multiple talks, and I know I'm not going to be distracted by like, well, if you know, if I bring my laptop, am I going to try to do other tasks or emails or whatever? You know, I know I'm just here to absorb, and um, it's a perfect laboratory to be like, well, I'm going to see how this goes. Um, over the course of the day, I'm going to try different stuff and here you go. Now you may, um, especially if you go to a conference with multiple talks, you know, you'll have a, a bunch of different experiments with you know, giving this a shot. Likely at the end of it, I think you'll, you'll probably come up with some strategies of like, well, here's some stuff that worked or didn't. And I think that's a giant leap toward, uh, making it a habit. And it's a bit of the, your other thought as far as when is it appropriate? And I, I you know, I kind of dodge that, but it's like, when do you think you would get a lot out of it, right? And have that, you don't have to share them. Right, right. As you pointed out, like they're largely for your use. That's the, the primary function. Mm -hmm. And I would say, yes, like any time where you're at uh, an event or in a situation where you want to really absorb the experience and and uh, be present for it, but have some kind of artifact to re reacquaint yourself with it after the fact. Um, mm. That's um, and, and I I would think anytime you're 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 going to a workshop or a conference where there's some kind of lecture situation. Uh, it's probably a, probably a, a good candidate. I think, I think that's a good final thought. I think we did a podcast again. I think so too. 239 of them. Oh my gosh. Well, that was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for exploring that with me, Jersey. Oh man. Thanks for setting this whole episode up. This was really, really good. Um, and I hope, I hope the leaners enjoyed it as well. If you did, you can let us know via the social media links we're going to share in just a second. Uh, the show is recorded every Thursday at 
10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central. And we stream it live on YouTube at leanintoart.com slash live. And then it's collected as a podcast afterwards, both audio and video, at patreon.com slash leanintoart. And we'll be back again with another one next week. Until then, I've been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. Oh, and I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger on the gram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to shut off the stream. Thanks, everybody. Yep, thanks for hanging out.